Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Now, today we're going to have another compilation episode focusing on connecting soil health to human health. Now, we've talked before about the importance of soil health and the environment, and whether it was Diana Rogers and her episode on the podcast or a rancher compilation where we talked to two different ranchers and a bio, bioregenerative um, farmer and talked about the importance of soil health just for soil in general, but also for the plants they grow and, of course, for the environment as well. But now trying to connect those dots to reemphasize how important those are and connect them to human health because there does seem to be a connection there. So um, eventually we're going to hear from um, Dr. Stefan Van Vliet um, and his studies that he's done. But first off, we're going to speak to a husband-wife team, um, Dr. David Montgomery and Anne Beclay, and they're authors who have written a number of books that you're going to hear about and sort of the progression of how it went from, again, from sort of soil um, to improving soil health, to plants, and then to human health on their latest book. Um, but first, so David is a professor of earth and space sciences at the University of Washington. He has a BS in geology from Stanford and a PhD in geomorphology from Berkeley. Uh, and his wife, Anne, has an extensive background in biology and environmental planning and in public health and how the environment affects well-being and human health. So together, they sort of make this great team to talk about the importance of soil, the importance of geology, and connecting that to human health individually and to public health. Um, and that's what makes uh, that's what I think makes their, their latest book, What Your Food Ate, so interesting. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into the first part of our interview here with David Montgomery and Anne Buclay. Well, David and Anne, thank you so much for joining me today on the Diet Doctor podcast. Sure, we're happy to be here. Definitely. Great. Yeah, well, we were just talking offline about sort of the the evolution of these books that you've written. And I think it's so fascinating because really what we're talking about is the the connection between soil, plants, animals, and humans, and the health of all of that. And that's kind of how your books have sort of transpired too a little bit, starting with dirt, talking about how soils affect civilizations and so dirt, the erosion of civilizations, and then transitioning into growing a revolution, talking about bringing soil back to life um, and changing the world from the ground up. So focusing on ditching the plow, growing uh, cover crops and diversification of crops. And we've talked about some of these things before on the Diet Doctor podcast, and now going to what your food ate, how to heal our land and reclaim our health. And that's the part that I find so fascinating, making the connection between healthier soil and healthier humans. So with that as an intro, you know, give us a little background about your progress and your journey through these books and through your learning process. <laughs> well, it's, it's been quite a process, and it really started with that book, Dirt, where I'm, you know, I'm a geologist by training and as a biologist. And Dirt really was sort of what you might expect a geologist to write about soils, sort of looking back at how we've eroded soils in society after society and how that's affected the course and fate of civilization since the dawn of agriculture. And, you know, I thought it, when I started writing that book, it, I was an, it was an attempt to update previous books that had focused on that those kind of connections. It seems like every 30, 40 years, somebody goes, oh, my God, you know, we need to protect the soil. And I was updating, you know, stuff I'd read from the 50s and the 30s that made that argument. You know, a lot of people argued that in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl. Um, and what I ended up writing wasn't so much a history of erosion as a history of farming, because that was the connection in terms of how we treated the land affected the way the land treated our descendants. And as I was wrapping up that book, writing about the sad history of land destruction, soil destruction and society after society around the world, we bought a house in North Seattle, and Anne, the biologist, is a major league gardener, and she was restoring fertility to our yard as I was documenting the past destruction of soils around the world, and she was doing it in a way that led to a book called The Hidden Half of Nature that focused on the, the microbial roots of life and health, sort of the, the, the connections between plants and their microbiome and the human body and our microbiome. Yeah. And I should probably let Anne tell a little more of that story. That led us then to thinking about, uh, you know, could we restore farms the way that Anne had restored our yard and how might you do it? And that led to interviewing farmers who'd already done it and growing a revolution. And then, you know, we came back together to co-author the new book, What Your Food Ate, looking at how all this relates back to human health. And so it was a very natural progression in terms of how we were 
moving from our backgrounds and training, putting these pieces together to make the linkages between the health of the land, the health of our crops, the health of our livestock, and ultimately our own health. Yeah. So, Anne, give us a little background on the on the biology side of this and, and sort of your journey through it as well. Yeah. I, you know, in some ways, people may think, geez, how come you guys didn't start with what your food ate? It, it sounds <laughs> like, you know, you, you have put this whole thing together, but we never we couldn't have done it that way, Brett, because, you know, like that proverbial onion that you peel back. Right. Book and each experience, we would see things differently and we would see different connections and relationships. And so I kind of, you know, just to like really summarize things, you know, uh, dirt is really about sort of the story of destruction of a portion of the environment that's critical for our health. And the, the second book really was the hidden half of nature. And that was sort of the insight, the insight about what it is uh, how our bodies work and how a plant's body works and how that is all related, you know, in the case of a plant, to its soil microbiome for us, not all of our health, but a lot of our health is, is wrapped around our, um, our microbiome, especially the, the little creatures in our gut. So that was the insight for us. And then growing a revolution really demonstrated, aha, at least in terms of the soil, there's a cure. Yeah. Can get soil back up on its, you know, little feet, proverbial feet there and get it functioning again. And so it went, you know, from destruction to, to insights, to cure and what your food ate. It's the implications of all of this, Brett. It's why, it's why we need to be looking at farming and agriculture as, as health policy and as a big factor in human, human health and well-being. And, yeah. and as I had remarked before, you know, my lens um, that I look at things through is is biology and uh, through life. And I have to tell you, you know, it's life is really resilient and and adaptive, and it can be really tough. I've seen that in a garden with um, my own plants. I've seen that myself coming through a major health challenge. And if you just give life half a chance. It can do a lot. It can it can get uh, f- you know functions back to normal, and um, back to a place where I sort of say you know it's at, at peace with the immune system, um, and and always kind of striving for this dynamic homeostasis. Yeah, and I want to enable, uh, you know, the plant body, the human body, the animal body to do what it sort of already knows how to do. So like the, the interventions in my mind around health are, are probably different than other people's because of my, my lens and my viewpoint. Yeah. And I love that comment you made that uh, about agriculture, farming has to be connected to public health. And with your background in public health, I can see how you draw those lines, but I think not enough people do. And, and in the book, you, you, you both sort of make the point that, you know, in a world where people are eating ultra processed junk food and overeating calories and we lose sight of, of the, the sort of the nuance or the details of how the food is raised, because really level one is just stop eating so much junk, eat whole foods, regular foods. If we do that, we really improve the health of society, but we can go further and we don't have to stop there. And so you talk about how even so-called health foods may not be grown in a healthy way and can be deficient or lower in some nutrients. So tell us about what what you learned about the nutrient deficiencies, even of healthy foods in today's modern agricultural society. Yeah, there's been a a number of studies that have looked at sort of the declining nutrient content of fruits and vegetables uh, and the the effects of food processing, of course, on grains and and removing removal of minerals and vitamins from our basic staples. Um, But there's a lot of work that goes back literally to the 1940s, documenting the sort of connections between what have become conventional agricultural practices and altered nutritional profiles of food. Now, whether food is less or more nutritious is is complicated by how you define nutrients. Um, But and that's a has been, you know, and the surprisingly big sort of area of confusion, I think, conflict um, in sort of looking into the field of nutritional studies from the outside. 
Um, but there's sort of three areas where we're, you're able to look at uh, the way that soil life and how it's affected by farming practices, things like tillage, plowing, things like nitrogen for, you know, overuse of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers uh, and overuse of insecticides, pesticides, herbicides. Uh, how those things affect the life in the soil affect what gets into our crops in terms of mineral micronutrients, because um, it turns out that fungal communities in the soil are really central partners with plants for getting mineral mineral elements, things like copper and zinc that you know we don't need a lot of in our bodies, but we really need that little bit an awful lot. Uh, you know, getting that into our crops is something that's a it's a biological job. And the way we have farmed uh, conventionally for you know, almost a century now has undermined those connections, the symbioses between soil mm -hmm. life and our crops. Uh, and it's also altered the phytochemical profile of our crops. And what are phytochemicals? Well, it's right there in the name, plant-made chemicals. These are chemicals plants make to, as part of their defensive systems you know, for, for purposes that they need. But it turns out that when they get into our bodies, they can be metabolized or our gut microbiota can metabolize them into compounds that influence our health. Um, and there's also been, it sh uh, we know that there's been differences in the fat composition and the balance, particularly of say omega-3 and omega-6 fats in our meat and dairy as a result of what we're feeding our livestock. So you can, you can trace these, these links between how we treat the soil affects how the plant uh, brings in mineral elements, uh, builds phytochemicals, you know, things that end up in our diet that affect us when we eat them, and then how those things can affect livestock as well based on what we feed them. You know, if we're feeding them you know, uh, grains in a feedlot, they end up with a very different fat profile than if yeah. they're raising diverse natural pastures, eating, you know, leafy greens that photosynthesized. Right. Uh, so those are the, the kind of connections there. And it's complicated along each step of the way. So what we do in the book is we break it into how the soil, how the way we treat the soil, how soil affects soil health, how soil health affects plant health, how plant health affects livestock health, and then how the latter two affect human health through what is in our diet. And as you were saying, you know, the first rule is probably, you know, eat healthier. We all know that, you know, a nice uh, a piece of fruit is better for us than a bag, whole bag of potato chips. Um, but that element of how we raise our food across the board has been relatively neglected, in part because it's complicated, but also in part because those things, micronutrients, phytochemicals, and the balance of fats aren't the things we've emphasized nutritionally for the last century, when right. a lot of worry was about growing enough food, enough calories to feed people. And the argument that Ann and I make in the new book is that you know we've gotten very good at growing a lot of food. Now we basically at, at trying to feed the world, and we grow enough to feed everybody if we distribute it equitably. Um, but we now need to focus on you know nourishing the world at the same time. Yeah, and, and I've had Ty Beal on the podcast where we talk about nutrient uh, deficiencies and insufficiencies of diets, and that's assuming that the the f foods they're getting have a certain number of nutrients, but depending on where that food is grown and how it's grown could make a really big difference. But if you're a farmer or a policymaker and you hear it might, it has a little bit more copper. If you grow it this way, it has a little more zinc and magnesium. You're like, eh, okay, that doesn't really move the needle for me because it might be costly to make the transition. It's people who don't really know how to do it. And, you know, maybe volume goes down. I, I'd imagine this is what people are thinking, which is why it's so important to sort of draw the connection. Well, first, there are myths that need to be debunked in that statement, but also to draw the connection to human health. So, so Anne, you've been talking about the microbiome. Is that is that the main connection that you would say between um, healthier soil, healthier grown foods, and then the impact on human's health? Is it mostly through the microbiome or are there other ways that that you see? I mean, the, the soil microbiome is a big, big factor in how, you know, what a plant sort of decides to do with respect to um, growth, uh, pushing back on pests and pathogens, and sort of, you know, the allocation of a plant's energy toward grow, you know, putting on biomass or, you um, you know, a more, I guess I would say, sort of uh, stable level of growth where it's not putting out all of this fresh new growth that pests just, you know, hop onto and start nibbling. So the the way I think about it is that um, 
crops and, and all the individual plants that make up a crop, they're, they're constantly in conversation with the soil microbiome. And by soil microbiome, let's just be a, a little specific on that. There, it's, it's not everything out there in the soil. There's a really special place um, that's just a very thin, thin zone, narrow zone around the roots um, of a plant. And this is where the action is. You know, th this is the, the, the New York City, the Stockholm. This is like, this is where <laughs> things are happening with the plant and its microbiome. And there are exchanges of all kinds happening. In, that area is called the rhizosphere. Rhizo meaning root, sphere just meaning area. And this is where, um, you know, fungi are off there fetching things in the soil that Dave had talked about. They bring them right to this doorstep of the rhizosphere, drop them off. And in exchange, the plant gives fungi, sugars, fats, proteins, this whole collection of um compounds called exudates. And so it's one of the grandest symbioses that we know about in all of biology. It's these ways in which uh, a plant, which is stuck in place, but uh, you know, fungi are not necessarily stuck in place. And it's how a plant meets its needs. And so you want that conversation, that relationship, and that communication to be robust, normal, on all the time. If there was more than 24 hours in a day, uh, that you'd want the plant, you know, communicating that many hours with all of this. And, and so as a part of this communication, that's how the plant is getting what it needs out of the soil. And it's not just, you know, transporting things from the soil into the plant body. A, a plant will also send signals down to its particular microbiota in the root zone the microbiota bacteria in particular, they get a hold of these plant-made compounds and they in turn use them to make other compounds that the plant takes back up. So this isn't something like copper or iron coming out of the soil. This is things like um, plant growth promoting hormones. So, mm. you know, the botanical world has farmed out a good deal of its know, life history strategy, we could call it, to the microbial world. Because why? Well, the microbes are down there in the soil. They're, you know, working in symbiosis with the plant. And that leaves the plant free to do other things, grow, flower, fruit, and and so on. And so that, when, when there's just um, an abundance of synthetic fertilizers and a lot of agrochemicals and a lot of tillage, uh, it, it's like ripping the roof off of a person's house and, and you know, sticking a fire hose in there, or a big giant egg beater. I mean, things, things, Brett, are just not going to be able to function well yeah. when you have that kind of chaos happening. And so this is one of the main ways in which modern farming affects nutrient density is it, it disrupts a lot of this stuff. And so you know, we know we know we can somewhat compensate for biology with agrochemicals and things like that, but it will never ever be uh, the same as or as good as as a normally functioning, you know, microbial community around the roots of a plant. What a plant can. Do. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you mentioned a, a number of interesting points there, and, and the use of fertilizer and wh what's called synthetic inputs to to a farm, I think, is so interesting because when you talk about cost and production, and I think there is this initial thought that the cost of transitioning to diversity of crops and cover crops and a healthier soil is expensive and hard to do, but then on the back end, you're spending a lot less on fertilizer and inputs. Um, but is even that enough to to encourage farmers to try this, um, or is that part of what you were trying to do with this book to you know to draw one one level even higher about health? But tell us about just just the cost and the the production and the volume. Is there enough there that people should be doing this anyway? Uh, you know, there there really is, especially with the rising price of fertilizers today. Um, yeah. It really spotlight on, you know, what are the, our options? And it turns out one of the, the sort of poorly known backstories of modern agriculture is how the rise of the modern agrochemical industry, uh, the fertilizer industry followed by the pesticide industry, was really rooted in soil degradation in Western Europe and North America. 
if you have really healthy, you know, organic matter rich, fertile soil with a lot of the, the kind of biological partnerships that Anne was just talking about, you don't get a benefit from adding more nitrogen to it because there's already enough nitrogen circulating. Right. But if you have degraded land, if you add nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, the sort of the big three of, of uh, agrochemicals in fertilizers, um, you can boost yield. Now, it turns out that that can actually reduce the nutrient density of crops because you're, you're basically spreading that layer of, of, uh, of zinc or iron or those other minerals that come out of the soil you know, thinner throughout a higher yield. There's a whole bunch of connection to the microbial world, again, that Ann was just going into. But there's a backstory in terms of why you, you can get much higher yields on degraded land by using synthetic fertilizers. Um, but there's other ways to do it. Uh, and one of the things that was very um, revealing to us in you know, the sequence of books um, was looking at that transition period from conventional to a more regenerative style of agriculture that involves you know, no-till practices coupled with cover crops and diversity. This, um, this sort of the recipe of, of conservation agriculture, if you will, which works really quite well to rebuild the health and fertility of the land over you know, years, not, not centuries. Um, but one of the key things that turned me into an optimist on this issue that more farmers will and are adopting it is that the costs of those inputs are so high now that if you can radically reduce them, yeah. even if you had a yield decline, you could be more profitable as a farmer. And in, in our experience of interviewing regenerative farmers who've been very successful at adopting these methods, um, their yields don't decline. They may have a, a couple of year a couple of year dip in yields because if you go straight from degraded soils into a different mat system, you shouldn't expect to be harvesting the same amount next year. But the decline is actually fairly short lived, and the response can be fairly rapid. But the decline in costs is immediate. Right. And so it you know the the it's. It's actually the farmers that we've interviewed that have adopted these methods are actually more profitable than their conventional neighbors. Um, and that's what turned us partly, you know, part of what turned us into optimists on this issue is that it actually seems to make a lot of sense for farmers and more and more of them are catching on. Uh, you know, as their neighbors are successful with these kind of approaches. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I find so interesting is that even don't even address the health aspect. It seems like there is a, there should be enough motivation from an environmental health and from a cost and productivity uh, argument that farmers should be moving this direction. And and look, I've got to say, I I'm I'm skeptical that the health argument will be strong enough to move the needle for a lot of people. And let me explain that. Be because I think when you talk about um, nutrition science and when you talk about medical science, you want a randomized controlled trial that lasts for you know 20 years showing people who ate from a regenerative farm had lower incidence of cancer and heart disease and diabetes than someone who ate from a, a traditional farm, right? And we know that study's never going to be done. I mean, that's just an impossible bar to set. but. But I would guess that's the bar that any skeptic is going to set and that anything less of that might be inadequate. So I'm curious just to get your opinions, what you think, what level of evidence we could get to say, yes, this makes a difference in human health. And would that be enough to sway some skeptics? I think what you're, put, you're basically getting to there is the difference between common sense and scientific certainty. Yeah. Right. And the sense what we tried to do in the book is to lay out the bits of science that have had that certainty associated with those kind of tests for all the individual links. And then you can stand back and go, oh, do those beads on the string actually connect the one to the other? And we're pretty confident they do because of that. But, you know, our individual health is so complex and variable. You know, there's our genetics, there's whether we exercise, there's our diet, uh, where we live, just, you know, where we live on topography turns out to matter for things like heart attacks in terms of, of like air quality. Uh, and each of those steps between the soil health, crop health, livestock health, and human health has equal, you know, has a lot of variability within it. So you're right that I think that, you know, the definitive study that definitely says that, you know, if we grow stuff in this following way, it will result in, you know, this much difference to this many people. It's going to be a while before that's figured out. But I think we know enough now in terms of the individual pieces to kind of go, you know, if you really want to eat healthy, Here's the direction you ought to be looking forward towards that, but there's no guarantee as to how much it will affect your individual health. Yeah. And, and Anne probably has a, 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 another perspective on this. Yeah, yeah please. The way I think about it is, um, in part, 
we've we've kind of run this experiment since um, I don't know, let's say you know early to the middle part of the last century with uh, human health and the Western diet. And let's just ask ourselves, how is that working out? <laughs> and it's not. It's not working out well for most of us, especially once we reach middle to to later later stages in life. It's just, it's been an assault on our physiology and on human biology. So we're not faring well. So in my mind, it's time to do something different. And a part of that is, is certainly has to do with, you know, yeah, let's just cut out the ultra processed food, but that's only one part of it. And that's about what we eat. If, if at the same time as we um, really, really reduce consumption of ultra processed foods, if we also increase uh, food that's grown regeneratively, or I would say even, you know, our very best organic farmers have been on to these linkages between organic matter and the soil microbiome and plant health and so on for a long time. So if we're eating food like that, the way I see it is that this is giving our body the kinds of nutrients in portions and levels that human health thrives on. I'm pretty sure, Brett, that uh, we start eating like that. I don't expect our health to decline or certainly, <laughs> you know, at the rate uh, the the levels of chronic disease, we're really I, I just don't see that happening. And there's all kinds of evidence, you know, that says it's really pretty unlikely that we're going to continue to see the increases that we have historically in chronic diseases if we are growing more, growing and eating more nutrient dense food at the same time as we're cutting out ultra processed food and all of the kinds of things that are that are in that. And the argument that I see people making is somewhat akin to if you think back to um, smoking. And what it took to get, uh, you know, basically regulation of the tobacco industry. And I don't think we want to spend two or three or four decades um, getting this evidence base together when the researchers and doctors and those, you know, who saw early on that smoking is just plain bad for, you know, the human lung. It's 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 bad, and we don't want to go on for two or three decades collecting the evidence. To tell us that it's time to start transitioning um, away. And and then I guess lastly, I would just say, you know, with respect to you know a randomized controlled trial, and and saying, okay, here's this one intervention on these you know this group of people, and we're going to replicate that, and we're going to take ten years to do it, and then we'll know we'll know that that's the diet. Dave mentioned variability. There's not our genomic variability, our microbiome variability. There's a reason for all that variability, and it's a really good one. And it has to do with evolution. And that is that something that that uh, I might be susceptible to. Well, just look at the the range of responses to COVID alone, right? Some people are asymptomatic, and some people are dead. Yeah. There's there's, you know, good reasons for human variability. And it's so that some of us keep going on and others of us, you know, don't. This happens across all species. So mm -hmm. that's the other reason I'm, uh, I'm reluctant and I'm not sure say, saying randomized controlled trials are the way to go because they might be good for that group of people. Or, and we also know that in biomedical research, it's been largely on um, Caucasian populations, human diversity is far beyond that. And so I don't think we, we will ever be able to say um, the diet everyone should be eating is these 10 things in yeah. these quantities, right? We just yeah. know, for example, in the United States, our indigenous populations don't do well on um, uh, on a lot of foods. So that, that are have come through um, modernization and, and Western life. So right. I don't, I kind of like this idea of equipping the human body in all of its variability with the things that we know at a general level and that there is evidence for and and saying that's we want to set up the processes for health. 
cannot set up health per se, because that has to do with all of these, you know, these, these other things. So the best we can do is set the foundation and let it rip. I like that description, set the processes for help and set the foundation for health. I like that. But in order to do that, in order to set the foundation, I mean, I, I think a big part of it is making the inputs less expensive. So or making the inputs for ultra processed foods may be more expensive and making the inputs coming from a regenerative, diverse, more healthy type of agriculture less expensive. And that takes usually has to take government involvement. Um, so I don't know, is one of your hopes from this book to sort of start this movement to move things up the ladder to get to that point? Or were you not even really thinking that far ahead? Yeah, you know, we, we'd love to see movement in that direction. And, it, you know, we've made some points along those lines in Growing Revolution. And part of our hope in this book is that by raising awareness that there is a connection to human health, uh, complicated as it is, yeah. um, that we could actually start talking at a policy level about, you know, agricultural policy as, as it pertains to public health broadly across the entire populace. You know, are we, are we subsidizing growing the right crops in the right manner? Um, and, you know, it's our opinion that we're not. Um, and there's lots of room for improving that. The farm bill comes up every few years. I think it's being renegotiated uh, this coming year again. And, you know, there are at the moment in the United States, at least, we're basically subsidizing fairly destructive agricultural practices that do not benefit human health. Is that wise social policy at a societal level? I, I would argue that it is not. And that what we you know, you look at the rising, uh, you know, the rise in diet related health care costs over the last few decades. Um, it's become very expensive to maintain the diet that we have in the United States. Um, and there's a lever through what we're what we're eating but also how we grow it, that we may be able to dial some of that back down. Um, and that's without even dealing with, you know, the, the personal costs and the trauma of poor health across the population. It's my view, and I suspect Anne's as well, but I won't speak for her, that the, you know, one of the, fun the primary roles of government should be looking after the health of our people and the, and the health of our land. And regenerative agriculture can help do both. It's not going to solve either, but it can help do both. And so we should be fostering it through, you know, the way our agricultural subsidies and programs and incentives are all set up. Yeah, I would just make go back to something I said earlier in response to your question about what is our hope with this book and where do we want it to go? And you know, there was the destruction of soil that was all of, you know, dirt. And then we had insights about, oh, how the soil actually works and plants and as well as the human body. And then we saw in Growing a Revolution, bringing soil back to life and all of the things that it meant for the farmers who were engaging in those practices. So with this book, how do we not take that science that on the ground experience and the problem of the destruction of soil and say, now this is where we're at in the narrative. Like we're not, the journey's not done, but the trajectory and the direction of that journey now needs to be in a different, you know, getting to a different place. So it's, um, it, it, yeah, I mean, I think it is our biggest hope that this book and the information in it get to people who are uh, the ones that are guiding and setting policy. Because as soon as you yeah. start tweaking policy, you begin changing behaviors, behaviors, especially of you know farmers who are growing many of these crops. And you begin changing behavior of consumers and companies. And so, you know, so to, you know, to use the, the food chain sort of metaphor, you know, from the ground up, from farmers growing the stuff to the consumers eating it, to even the food companies making these things, and even to the doctors that are treating people because of diet-related conditions, it, it's going to take all of this. You know, it's sort of like climate change, where there's not any one thing that that's going to tackle climate change, and the same with sort of the, the the situation around chronic diseases and human health these days. There's not any one thing. It's this whole set of factors. And that's yeah. what I, I say in part, you know, we're going to set this found, uh, setting the foundation, right. Push that first domino and. Right. There it goes. Right. 
Yeah, it, that, I think that's very well said. Now, I want to go back to something you said at the very beginning, David, that, that every, you said every 30 years or something, it seems like this topic has come up about importance of soil health. Now, to me, it feels like it's here to stay. Like this is so important and impacts so many different things from human health to environmental health to animal health. That is, it's got to be here to stay in a continued discussion. But did people think that every time it came up in the past too? And do you think it's like it's going to have its 15 minutes and then fade into the background again? Well, you know, the, the real difference is that in the past, the sort of cycle of books that you can trace back a long way, it was really focused on soil erosion, the loss of the soil itself, and not so much on soil health. And what I think is so promising today is the emphasis on soil health. Because at the dawn of the conventional agricultural era, sort of the 1930s, 1940s, um, you know, the idea of soil as something that just well, plants grew in and it held them up. You know, you didn't want to lose the soil because then where would you grow your plants? Yeah. That was kind of the level of thinking. Um, there were certainly methods, traditional methods, you know, in many parts of the world for enhancing soil fertility that I can get to in a minute. But the idea of soil as something that has health is actually fairly new. And I think it's a very powerful concept and a very real and good concept. There's still arguments about really how to define it, but how do you define human health? I mean, we know it more by its absence than how yeah. to crisply define it. And I think with the soil, it's very similar. Um, and you know, the brutal reality is that a lot of the world's agricultural land, the soil is sick and ailing. And I think we can, you know, the, the subtitle of Growing a Revolution, Bring Our Soil Back to Life was a very intentional pun on, you know, how we could re revive the soil by actually enhancing the, the microbial life in the soil. Um, the, you know, so that cycle of sort of people pointing out that erosion is a bad thing is what you can really relate, you know, over multiple decades. And that's what I was trying to do when I wrote Dirt. What I ended up was writing a thesis on how farming practices throughout history had degraded soil health, which degraded the health of civilization, sort of human health at the entire population scale. Yeah. And now with the new book, we're sort of trying to connect it more to the to the individual and looking at how, you know, what is the state of the ag agronomic and biomedical science that that connects those dots? Um, and even if, you know, they get the, the broader the scale from an individual to you know the public at large, it gets fuzzy as you as you go out to that scale. Um, but we, we kind of viewed our job as translating the science that's hidden out there in journals in different disciplines and trying to integrate it to assess whether or not there's an integral story to be told and then try and tell it in a way that you know it's not just scientists that are going to be interested in reading it so right. a lot of what ann and i do in writing these books is trying to figure out how to translate and tell the story in a way that you know someone would actually want to read this yeah, and I think you do a great job with that. I mean, I think it's very readable and very approachable and, and makes sense. Like you're saying, it, it makes sense. It's not hiding behind lots of big, long words and big, complicated descriptions to try and get a point across. It, it, it makes sense. Um, and, and so I think it's a great read, and I highly recommend it because I think we do need to start to make this connection between soil, plant, animal, human health, and bring it all together. So so thank you so much for writing it and for all the books you've done and all the contributions you've made to this to this field and to this progression. Um, so if, you know, other than getting the book, if people wanted to kind of learn more about both of you or find out more about what you're up to, where can you direct them to go? We can... Uh, we our website is uh, dig to grow. And so that's D I G the number two grow.com. And uh, also we're, we're about to enter back into the world of Twitter. We've been on hiatus for quite a while due to pandemic and moving and things like that. And but, writing a book and writing yeah. a book that, that, that we're going to be entering that, you know, that fray again. Uh, for better, and, for worse. <laughs> That's where people can um, can find us. Yeah, and our Twitter handle is at dig to grow. Same thing. D I G the number. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much. I will definitely follow you on Twitter, and I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. So, thank you both so much. Our pleasure. Yeah, no worries. It's fun to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to uh, Dr. Stefan van Vliet. Now, he has a PhD in kinesiology and community health, and a master's in nutrition science. 
and he's worked at Duke University for a number of years, Duke University School of Medicine, studying the molecular mechanisms of food and, the, and nutrients and how they impact human metabolism. So now he's an assistant professor of nutrition and dietetics and food sciences at Utah State University. And he's another one who's in this realm of connecting the soil, the plants, the animals, the humans, um, the different components, the compounds, the primary and secondary compounds that he calls them, um, and if we can connect that to human health. And it's all sort of the spectrum that's moving in this direction that I just find so fascinating. And it was a really good discussion about this, specifically about two studies that he did looking at phytonutrients in meat, which is something not a lot of people think about. They really associate phytonutrients with plants, which is what the name says. And also looking at the, the actual nutrition differences between plant-based burgers and actual real meat um, because it's the marketing may say they're the same, but his studies show they clearly weren't the same. So we talk about these studies and all the sort of concepts that that surround them in this in this uh, spectrum of plants, uh, sorry, soil, plants, animals, and human health. So let's hear from Stefan von Vliet. Stefan von Vliet, thank you so much for joining me on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Brett. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Now, w one thing I've learned so much about is this as I've gone through this health journey of, of, of myself and teaching others is this connection between the, the soil, the plants, the animals, the health. And I really get excited talking about people who try and bring all that together. So you're definitely on the sort of on the forefront of that field as I see it. And I think it's such an interesting topic and you have a couple of papers that came out recently that I just want to start with these papers and talk about kind of what you found and the, the theories behind it and how you think it impacts our discussion about plants versus animals, human health, how it's all grown. So the first one is health promoting phytonutrients are higher in grass fed meat and milk. And this is so interesting because this concept of phytonutrients, I think if you asked a thousand people, 999 are going to say phytonutrients come from plants. They come from vegetables and fruit, period. But here's a, a paper talking about phytonutrients in grass-fed meat and milk. So tell me a little bit about sort of the background in looking into that paper and what you found and what you think the implications are. You are correct that phytonutrients are, as the name would suggest, nutrients from plants. So, but when an animal consumes uh, those plants, a lot of those phytonutrients become incorporated into their tissues, into their meat and milk, and even in the case of chickens, in their eggs. Uh, so when the animal is consuming uh, forage, mainly on pasture, because uh, fresh greens, fresh pasture is uh, very high in phytochemicals, then these phytochemicals do actually appear in, uh, in meat and milk, and that's what we found in, in that paper. And uh, a lot of that was initially based on uh, the older literature that was done in, uh, in France and Italy mainly studied in cheeses. So what the French and Italian scientists did, they were interested in flavor, in flavor compounds, because these phytochemicals, besides having potentially anti-inflammatory, antioxidant effects and impacting our, our metabolism, typically for the good, because uh, they, they may have, at least in uh, cell models or in vitro models, so in a, in a very controlled lab environment, you know, you might throw some phytochemicals on a cancer cell line and you see a reduction in cancer. Not per se to say that if you eat grass-fed beef, that you reduce your risk of cancer. It'd be very hard to prove, and I don't, not, not saying that, but okay, these phytochemicals have potentially potent health effects. Now, when the animal is consuming these, these phytochemicals, they can incorporate into the meat and milk, and the French at times had studied this regarding flavor, because these phytochemicals, besides uh. Uh, these health effects, they also act as flavor compounds. So when I was looking at that literature, uh, and we were doing our work in grass-fed beef, I'm looking at those and, and I'm like, well, you know, as a background, as a nutrition scientist, I'm looking at those, it's like, okay, they may have flavor, they may get flavor, but these are also compounds that have potent health effects, right? So we started to kind of look at it from a different perspective and, and look at the health effects. And um, so the initial inspiration was really that, that work that was done uh, by Italian and French scientists in the 90s and 2000s. And uh, we've kind of taken that using more newer techniques because they were typically able to identify uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, 10 to 20 compounds. But using our, our newer techniques, yeah, we routinely identify uh, about uh, five, 600 compounds. Not all of those are phytochemicals, but we use a technique that's called metabolomics. Mm -hmm. Metabolomics is the study of metabolites. Now, uh, some nutrients, uh, or I should say, if you look at the metabolites, 
several of these metabolites serve as nutrients. So not all uh, metabolites are nutrients, but all nutrients are certainly metabolites. Okay. These are metabolites produced either by the soil, uh, although I wouldn't recommend directly eating soil, but these are produced by the soil, by the plants, by uh, uh, animals, and they some of those can serve as nutrients to us. And so you see this this uh, sort of transfer of phytochemicals from the plant into the animal and accumulating these in in, in the meat. And uh, and yeah, actually, this is what people often refer to as uh, nutrient density in, in secondary metabolites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really interesting because so one of the concerns about, or one of the purported concerns by people who are in favor of low carb diets is you have a deficiency of these phytochemicals and phytonutrients. Now, if you're eating uh, meat that comes, grain fed meat that comes from a CAFO type facility, you know, that cow's been on grass for the majority of their life, but just the past, you know, the last few months they, they are, will be eating grain and corn and soy and whatnot compared to uh, a cow that's been on grass its entire life. So is, is that what you studied um, to see the difference of phytonutrients? Because that would clearly go against this argument that you're deficient in, in which there's no known deficiency of phytonutrients, but the argument that you're, you're missing out on the phytonutrients would be completely debunked if we showed that properly raised um, cattle are higher in these phytonutrients. So it seems like that's what you found. Yes, that, that that is correct. There's a few things to unpack there. So yeah. the, the first thing would be that uh, um, the phytonutrients. We have done comparisons of grass fed and grain fed, and as you point out, typically animals are in the feedlot for the last uh, three to four months of their life. But you'll be surprised how big the differences uh, still get. So yeah. uh, initially, we were, when I was doing, we were doing some of this work. I also thought, well. Uh, 120 days in the feedlot, how much uh, of a difference or, you know, how much right. damage can you do to those secondary yeah. metabolites, if that makes sense? Well, it turns out you can do a lot because we've done uh, some work with uh, bison too and beef, but there's some really also nice older work that showed that, uh, okay, you know, you have a certain level of phytochemical richness when the animal comes off the pasture. 60 days later, that is already cut in, cut in half. And by oh, the wow. time 120 days later, um, it is about threefold lower the phytochemicals, mm -hmm. and actually, when and this is work from the '80s, and we start, start to replicate that, and we also found something like that: two and a half, threefold lower in, uh, in phytochemicals. And we did a really nicely controlled study with bison on a on a farm, one of the Turner ranches in in South Dakota and Nebraska. So what we did in that study was we, there was a big herd of bison, about a, a thousand bison. Um, they were all from the same herd. Uh, they were kept on pasture or a subset of those were put into a pen. So it's a, technically a feedlot, but we call it what's called a pen. Uh, the bison have about four times more space than cattle there because a bison in a feedlot doesn't do as well. They're semi-wild animals, right? They, uh, and they also have free choice access to uh, grain, uh, hay, and alfalfa. So in contrast to cattle, they could also kind of select what they wanted to eat, but they still yeah. ate a lot of corn. And what we found was is that we profiled 600 metabolites and we found that 380 of them were different between the pasture group and the grain fed group, which is a pretty big difference if you consider that because the only thing that we did different was we let one group stay on pasture and the other group was put in a, in a pen for 140 days. Yeah. And we found major differences in phytochemicals, uh, in fatty acids too, um, the omega-3s, but... And I think this is often under-recognized is because we think of saturated fat, right, as something that's bad. And it's an overly simplistic view because there's many saturated fatty acids, but the long-chain saturated fatty acids, the very long-chain saturated fatty acids, uh, behanic acid and, and, and various other ones, uh, um, also the odd-chain fatty acids, those are often associated, even in epidemiology, with a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And you also see in randomized controlled trials that they have differential effects on cholesterol and triglycerides, a beneficial effect, actually. So we also saw those become enriched in the pasture-fed animals. We saw uh, more vitamin and mineral metabolites, B vitamins. We saw those phytochemicals change. And the animals also looked uh, healthier. Just to give you an analogy, I'm, I'm trained as a muscle biologist and physiologist, and we've also do uh, quite a bit of work on people with metabolic syndrome and people that have uh, uh, 
that are more endurance trained athletes or, or resistance trained athletes. And we take muscle biopsies from them, so a small piece of muscle. Um, now, obviously, when we study meat from the uh, animal, right, we also have their muscle from another right. mammalian species, humans and, 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 and bison or cattle. And we often think we're very different, but actually we're not when it gets to <laughs> metabolism. We're, we're pretty, pretty similar. And what we found then also regarding health is that the pasture fed animals, they had more mitochondrial metabolites, uh, less oxidative stress, uh, they had a better glucose profile. So it was kind of interesting and, and we have to follow this up. But as compared to the grass fed animals, so the grass fed animals can have this endurance strength athlete phenotype. And comparatively, the, the, the pen finished animals, they started to look, you know, they started to get sort of, you know, yeah, metabolic dysfunction uh, yeah, uh, phenotype compared yeah. to the pet fed animals i don't know on a scale you know they might still be very healthy comparatively i in my next study we want to actually directly compare some muscles from people with metabolic syndrome to the cattle and see get a feel for it you know how uh, how how does it stack up because my yeah. guess would be, would be that uh yeah i have no idea on a sliding scale they may be very healthy but as compared to the pasture fed animals they are definitely less healthy metabolically, and that, that translates also in nutrient density. So, uh, right, right, um, and and you see that very clearly. That's why uh, those those three hundred metabolites, I just three hundred and eighty. Some of them are related to nutrients. Some are related to health. And, and we see big differences there. Yeah, I mean, it's surprising how quickly and how dramatically um, those change. So, but now the jump is saying, well, okay, this may be true, but what does it mean for human health? And, and so that, that's a bit of a mechanistic leap, leap. And, but I mean, not unfounded at all. I mean, certainly can kind of quote unquote make sense, but like one argument is, okay, grass fed meat has been shown to have more omega threes than grain fed meat. But then the argument is, look, if you're really concerned about your omega threes, eat some fish. Like you don't need to, you know, on the absolute scale, it's not that big. So with the absolute scale of these phytonutrients, how does it compare to blueberries and, to, you know, leafy greens or, you know, some of the other foods that are said to be high in phytonutrients? Yeah, no, just to make it clear, vegetables are definitely a primary source like yeah. plant food of, of phytonutrients and they all have a, a much uh, uh, higher intake. Typically they are in if you have a direct source of uh, fruits and vegetables, they're five to 20 fold higher, depending on, on the phytonutrient that you look at. So I would definitely say uh, those will be the primary source in the diet. And the fact that they appear in animal source foods does not mean you should not get them from, from plant source foods. I, I sincerely believe that, that uh, uh, there's benefits to eating both plant foods and animal source foods because they work in synergy. Some nutrients are better obtained from plant foods, some better obtained from animal source foods. And you actually oftentimes see, right, with you eat beans and beef, that actually the iron and the zinc from the beans gets better, uh, gets absorbed better. Uh, mm -hmm. If you see the combination of heme and non-heme iron from plant and animal source yeah. foods. So it seems to be the synergy where, uh, where the combination of the two is very good. But uh, some nutrients, definitely individual uh, compounds, they may only be found in, in animal source foods or higher in animal source foods. The reason being is that the animal consumes uh, vegetation that you and I obviously cannot consume directly, right? These are uh, grasses, but also a lot of shrubs and forbs and things like that. Right. So we do see some, you know, unique terpenes, uh, which are also a, a class of, of phytochemicals with potentially anti-inflammatory, antioxidant effects. So we see some unique terpenes appearing some unique polyphenolic compounds that are typically uh, uh, yeah, lower in, uh, in, in certain plant foods. So I see this more as like sort of a, a secondary role. It's, it's like, you know, to give you an analogy of zinc, right, or, or iron, animal source foods are more bioavailable uh, sources of that, better sources of that, but you can still get meaningful amounts from plant foods. Right. With the phytochemicals, it's kind of the same. Yes, the plant source foods are the primary source of that, but you can get some unique uh, and additional phytochemicals from, from animal source foods too, particularly when they've been raised on pasture. Uh, although I must also admit, bread is not that black and white because we've done profiling now on, on multiple feedlot systems. And uh, if you feed, for instance, more alfalfa in the feedlot and a little bit less corn, 
alfalfa is also rich in several phytochemicals. So you can mm-hmm. kind of uh, get some phytochemicals uh, higher, actually. And it, I'd imagine it may differ from pasture to pasture, too, depending on the quality of the soil. It comes back to sort of the health of the soil and and, and what type of grass is being grown, you know, based on the, the, the soil quality. So I'd imagine there are a lot of variables that are hard to control, but even with those variables, you're able to demonstrate higher phytonutrient content in those uh, cattle that have been on pasture their whole lives. So even then, it's still pretty impressive. Yeah, and to your point of uh, how grass-fed beef isn't grass-fed beef isn't grass-fed beef, what we typically see, the more biodiverse pastures with you know yeah. 10 plants, 20 plants, uh, the bison were actually had access to like two, 300 plants during the grazing season. We've, we've done some profiling with a farmer up in uh, southern Idaho. His name is Glenn Alzinga from Alder Spring Ranch. And he uh, raises his animals. Uh, he herds them uh, on mountain pastures. And we know mountain pastures are amongst the most biodiverse pastures and phytochemically rich. So again, his animals have access to about 200 plants during the grazing season. And you can see that that plant diversity is really beneficially impacting the phytochemical richness. So if you have to see this on a sliding scale, is that the more biodiverse pastures means a higher amounts and a wider diversity of phytochemicals in the meat. Typically also a more favorable omega-6 to 3 ratio. You see that too. Mm-hmm. So that uh, those are also have the, the most omega-3s. Uh, the animal typically is also healthier because they can self-select their diet so they can know animals are actually quite good at that that's why it's always funny is that uh, humans need to spend billions of dollars being being told (laughs) what to eat right and 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 things like that whereas an animal can kind of figure out a non-human animal what they need to eat learn from their mother but also instinctively they know it so which which for me it's hard to imagine that we are the only uh, species that uh, uh, can figure out what to eat. I think deep down we must still be able to kind of intuitively know. What, yeah, if we, uh, if what we would go back, you know, a couple centuries, we probably were like that. But you know, our, as a society, we really messed that up. So I think that's a yeah, good yeah, it's also our environment, right? With the with yeah. the great uh, ultra processed foods that taste exactly. amazing, but do not provide the nutrients. But but anyway, the animal is able to select the. the the forages that work for them that, that maximizes their health and as a result also maximizes their uh, their phytochemical richness of their meat. Because we see this tight connection between animal health and nutrients because, uh, like I said, these these metabolites that the animal incorporates, I mean, they don't uh, produce those for us to eat, right? Some of these can serve as nutrients, but it is to optimize their health and metabolism. And then many of these can serve as nutrients. Same for plants, right? Plants are not grown for us to consume. They are right. uh, grown them to survive and, and uh, proliferate, uh, but we can get nutritional value from that. So we see that clearly. And then with the monoculture pasture, these phytochemicals are reduced quite a bit. So if an animal only has access to like one or two very dominant species of grasses, another thing is, is that what a lot of farmers do, they do rotational grazing. So they move the animals around regularly. They leave a lot of forage on the field, right? But the continuous grazing and, and We've seen it all over again now that I was traveling to North Dakota last week with the continuous grazing. You know, the grass might already be like grazed down and it's only June, right? Mm. We still have a whole season to go. So, but with with really uh, good management, um, with frequent rotations, you see that, uh, yeah, those animals are, are healthy and also have more phytochemicals. First, the monoculture, continuous grazing, and then it's further reduced in the feedlot. Uh, that's where you typically see the lowest amount of phytochemicals. And why is that? Because a lot of the corn and, and dried hay, it just doesn't contain a lot of phytochemicals. What you, yeah. what you see when, you, uh, uh, when the animal would consume fresh plants or you turn that field into a, a bale of hay, you see a fourfold reduction when you dry mm-hmm. that grass, right? You see a fourfold reduction of phytochemicals in the hay as a result already. Yeah. So when you then feed it to the animal, obviously you get uh, you get less. So yeah, you definitely see these uh, these big changes. So so it's really interesting because you know I I personally believe you know everybody should be raising their cattle in a rotational way in a regenerative way with biodiversity and and this is sort of one more piece of evidence as to why that is. But I'm afraid it's you know still not enough. You know not enough to get 
whether it's subsidies or to get, you know, um, more encouragement for people to do it. It's, it's like you need that, that next step to link to human health, which we don't have yet. But I mean, you start to see this groundswell of just more and more information and the environmental reasons. So just more and more lines of evidence saying, yes, we should try and transition as much as we can to this way of raising animals on pasture. It's definitely a growing, uh, field and, uh, and, and of course, there's also some critique about uh, where individuals feel that, uh, you know, we cannot convert everything to pasture. We need a lot more land for that. And, uh, and, and it's true, you need more land. But what we also see on some of the farmers that we work with, year after year, they increase their stocking density. So the amount of animals that they have. And they're not overgrazing. So they, they are having more productive vegetation and they're able to, you know, increase their herd size with 20, 25% over, yeah. over time. Um, so that is true, but it's also when we do some of this modeling on, on how much land we need is also based on the status quo, right? Uh, so that's also important to note. And, you know, you can have well integrated crop livestock systems too. It's not that, uh, uh, it has to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. One thing that, uh, uh, a lot of farmers do is that, uh, after, for instance, corn or wheat or soybeans have been harvested, you have a lot of the stalks left, right? Then putting some animals on there to graze that residue and then refertilizing the field. That is a great way of, of right. cycling nutrients, right? So um, those are an, and a great way of feeding animals during the winter period. Also, when the, maybe some of the grass would go dormant and, and now the use of cover crops, uh, which animals can graze. Um, is another thing that's that is being now more supported by the by the government too. So that is definitely because there was a push for uh, for that. Yeah. So it is certainly a growing area. The, right now, you know, not everybody can find meat that's been raised this way. Not everybody can afford meat that's been raised this way because it's much more expensive. So I, I would never tell somebody you have to eat this meat or don't eat many, any meat at all. But the question is, you know, when are we going to eventually get to the point where this is commonplace and more affordable. And I know nobody can answer that question, but I think it's the, the additional lines of evidence that people like you are helping uncover and discover and, and promote that are going to help us in that direction. So I think that is important. No, I agree. And, uh, and, and certainly, uh, you know, does that mean we, we will get rid of feedlots or per se? I mean, I don't see that, you know, per se happening. And it must also be a rea realistic, uh, I don't think the reason we have a metabolic health crisis here in the U.S. is because we're eating grain-fed beef, right? Uh, yeah. So switching out uh, uh, a uh, grain-fed patty with a grass-fed patty doesn't make a happy meal a healthy meal all of a sudden, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it must also be that realistic. But what we do see is that there's yeah additional uh, health-promoting compounds uh, that are being accumulated. And yeah. Yeah, depending on the metrics that you look at, of course, I mean, an animal emits more greenhouse gas emissions when it's longer on pasture, but okay, there's also potential to uh, sequester uh, mm -hmm. that, that carbon. And we have this really uh, intensive focus on greenhouse gas emissions, a simplified uh, uh, metric that we look at, but we also have to look at, you know, water usage, runoff, uh, chemical use, and, and things like that, right? Right. Um, growing feed for cattle, which, uh, yeah, oftentimes uh, uh, is, is, they consume obviously less of that, and they consume, right. you know, byproducts, or, or uh, depending on the region, uh, there may be year-round grazing, and uh, and depending also the adaptation of the animal, there's definitely also farmers up north that have their animals outside all year round. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, if you also have... Uh, a rumen and like a bison, for instance, they can they can do very well. They can go uh, a half a meter deep into the snow to seek forage. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. and and they do very well. So, but even cattle, when they're locally adapted, uh, they can do well in in uh, certain environments, uh, provided they've been selected to to survive those environments. So, yeah. those are all the other things that you know. It's it's a complex uh, issue and and. We have to take into account uh, multiple, uh, yeah, multiple aspects of that. But we are often focused on greenhouse gas emissions, and then yes, if you only look at the, at that side of the equation, you could think that grass-fed animals are, uh, are are more destructive to the environment. But I always think of it in this way: if we if you look at your you know, it doesn't make sense to only look at your expenses, but not your income, right? Right. If you're right. Financial, so, and that's kind of what we're Great doing. Great analogy. Like, okay, these are the emissions. Well, what is the potential uh, yeah. 
you sequester that. And, then, and the, the animal doesn't sequester that. The plants obviously do. But right. having animals well integrated in that system can uh, help uh, uh, with, uh, with soil health. And, 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 and we see this on these well-managed pastures. The soil organic matter and the soil carbon is higher in, in those pastures, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, so there are a lot of good points in there that, that I don't need to repeat, but uh, very good points. But I, I do like the perspective of... Um, you know, grass-fed meat with fries and a Coke and a shake isn't <laughs> the path to health. So th- I, I thought that was very good. You pointed that out. So, but now transitioning to the, the other paper that I wanted to talk about that you that you wrote, Metabolomics Comparison of Plant-Based Meat and Grass-Fed Meat Indicates Large Nutritional Differences Despite Comparable Nutrition Fact Panels. Now, this is a big topic because there's obviously a pretty big push for plant-based meats, even if the market share hasn't really gone up much and you know some of the companies are doing poorly financially but the the narrative sort of the the common media social media narrative is certainly in 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 favor of plant-based meats and that they're sort of nutritionally equivalent to animal real meats um in terms of you know protein content and when you look at the the nutrition labels but what your study said is, hold on, not so fast. So, so tell us a little bit about the findings in that study. Well, the short end of it, the, the one sentence spiel is that they're not nutritionally interchangeable. Uh, only if you look at a very, you know, small number of nutrients. But um, we used metabolomics to look at. Uh, we profiled about two hundred metabolites, and, and many of these are, are nutrients. So. Oftentimes, if we pick up a nutrition facts panel, right, there's uh, 30 nutrients that routinely appear on that. So I might pick up some beef, I might pick up a, a plant-based meat alternative, and I look at the protein, I look at the fat, I look at the vitamins and minerals, and they're roughly similar. Uh, very similar, actually, because a lot of the plant-based meat alternatives are uh, they use a protein isolate or concentrate like soy or pea, uh, mung bean, uh, rice. So they have similar protein content. Uh, often use isolated fats too, like sunflower or coconut oil to give it that sizzle, right? So similar amount of fat, saturated fat. And then they're often fortified with vitamins and minerals. Not all of them, but some are. The mm-hmm. product that we tested was. So you might pick up those packages as a consumer and think like, oh, I get similar nutrients. But uh, foods contain hundreds to thousands of nutrients that are potentially capable of impacting our health. So there's 150 nutrients that we routinely track in nutrient uh, databases of the USDA. But even that is scratching the, the tip of the iceberg. So, because there are thousands of compounds. And if you even look at those phytochemicals, those secondary compounds, there's probably hundreds of thousands of compounds that yeah. can impact our metabolism and health. So if we dig a little deeper than just the nutrition facts panels, then yeah, that's what we did. Then they are as different as you expect meat from a cow and quote unquote meat from a plant to be because they're very much different organisms. And, and that's what we found. So we did a metabolic profiling study. We uh, got uh, 18 uh, grass fed beef samples and we compared those to, uh, to a, a plant based meat alternative, a very popular one. Um, and we cooked those up in our metabolic kitchen. We took samples of that, put in liquid nitrogen, uh, processed them, run them through a mass spec, identified several hundred compounds, and we found a 90% difference in metabolite abundance. And it, so they are very different. And yeah. a lot of them, yeah, about, about a quarter of uh, all the metabolites that we identified, the nutrients that we tab- identified, were either found only in beef or only in the plant-based meat alternative. And these are things that are, are well known also, things such as creatine, uh, which is important for our muscle, but also our brain. Uh, taurine, which plays a role in nearly every uh, process in, in our body, cellular process, important for eye health, heart health, muscle health, brain health. And serine, also important for, uh, for metabolic function. There's been several randomized controlled trials with answering uh, mm-hmm. for, for cognitive function, hydroxyproline. Um, we found a variety of, of, of nutrients that were exclusive to the animal source foods, but there were also many nutrients, especially isoflavones and certain phenolic compounds that were only found in the plant-based meal alternative. Right. So our paper was simply saying is that we cannot really determine which one is healthier. It's kind of also a moot point. That's not what we're studying. 
But what we can say confidently is that they're not the same. Right. So again, the taking the leap to say, how does this impact human health? Who knows? Like that, that is a black box at the moment, but just to, just to uncover this data to, to really allow people to say, no, they are not the same. And the, the commercials might say they're the same. The nutrition label might say they're the same, but really I think the, the most impactful and educational part of this is saying nutrition labels are just scratching the surface, just like you said. And there are all these other factors we need to consider and we can't fake nature. Like we can't just completely replicate, um, nature in these, in these products. So don't expect it to be the same, even if the marketing says it is. I, I, I think that's the biggest take home. And I, that's why I was really drawn to that study. And I think it's so important just for that lesson alone. And now, actually, I don't know if, if you've read about this. I just saw this recently at the time where we're, we're filming this, that, um, there's now like a, a lawsuit saying that, um, these plant-based proteins are overstating the actual amount of protein. Are you are you up on that or have anything to say about that? Yeah, so the lawsuit revolves around, uh, well, there's two pieces to it. And one, I don't think the filer has a, has a very strong case because the nutrition label of Beyond Beef says it contains 20 grams of protein. And when they profile, it contains 19 grams of protein. Okay. But <laughs> no, we, we do a lot of the profiling too. That's very much within the analytical error, one gram. But, okay, another part of the piece is that uh, uh, you, when you have 20 grams of protein, that is 40% of the the daily value of of protein. But that is based on a PDCAS score, which is a protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. It tells you something about the uh, quality of the protein. So beef has a PDCAS score uh, close to one. So that 20 grams of protein, uh, and, and one is the highest score, that 20 grams of protein it provides you actually with the amino acids uh, that are sort of complete and, and, and would make up, uh, would truly give you 40% of the daily value. Mm-hmm. Beyond beef, it contains pea protein. Uh, that's the main ingredient. And uh, that second one escapes me uh, now, but I think it might be mung bean, I think, mung bean protein. But the PDCAS scores of those are lower. They're yeah. typically around like 0.8 or so. So in reality, instead of giving uh, 40% of the daily value, you, you get less, right? Like 30, 25% or so. So that label is, is, is not probably 100% correct. I was kind of surprised to see that, uh, that, that, that lawsuit, though, because uh, I know they're very strict on that with supplements and it, it, that people have labels like that. But... I'm not sure if Beyond Beef is the only one who does that. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. It'll be interesting to see uh, what uh, shakes out. But yeah, in reality, the percent daily value should probably be lower because it has to be based on the PDCAS score. And, and that tells you something about A, how digestible is that protein source? And B, uh, how complete is that amino acid profile? And the right. animal source foods and milk, they have a com- uh, more complete amino acid profile where typically uh, the plant sources, they're either deficient in, uh, or lower, I should say, in lysine, methionine, uh, and or cysteine. So they have, a, therefore, for that reason, a, a lower score. Um, so right. yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah. So again, it might be um, more stink than it's worth, so to speak, because the, the practical difference may not be all that big, but the concept is still very important that the the digestibility, the absorbability, the bioavailability of the protein is different than in meat. So again, coming back to this theme, even though they claim equivalence, they're not the same, either for better or for worse. They're they're clearly not the same and are not going to be the same. So don't expect them to be the same. Yeah, a study that came out yesterday, actually, I think it was in Advances of Nutrition. It uh, profiled Beyond Beef and it profiled beef, matched for protein content. Yeah. And what they found was, is that the amino acid availability after eating was lower in Beyond Beef than in the beef, which comes back to the amino acid uh, uh, profile of those foods. So there's now also a study to suggest that is the case, looking specifically at Beyond Beef. But we we already knew this from years of profiling soy protein isolate, pea protein isolate, and other uh, vegetable sources of protein that they give a uh, lower muscle anabolic response at modest amounts at like this 20 to 25 gram uh, amount. You can certainly, if you eat more of the plant protein, let's say if we ate 
two beyond beef patties and one beef patty, then we sort of, you know, negate the differences in uh, uh, amino acid profile because you're giving so much if you're eating twice as much protein, right? Right. And, uh, uh, you, that's why studies would suggest that if you're if you get only uh, if you're relying on plant sources for protein, that if you consume enough of it, 1.7, 1.8 grams per kilogram body weight, that the difference between animal and plant source proteins become uh, less important. But at these yeah. more modest intakes, you see that uh, the skeletal muscle anabolic response to plant sources like uh, uh, the ones that are used in Beyond Beef or the Impossible Burger would give a lower muscle anabolic response than if you consume the equivalent amount of, of protein from beef. So, And that is also what the, the lawsuit uh, kind of revolves around, that, uh, okay. hey, you know, 20 grams of protein, but the amino acids that are in there yeah. Uh, are uh, yeah, of lower bioavailable uh, value. Great point. So it's not that you can't get everything you need from the plant burger, you just need more of it. And so then it comes with more calories and more carbs and more other things that are packed into the burger. So again, it's just sort of that perspective. But, but I think this discussion has been really good to, as, as one more piece of the puzzle of the, the soil, the plants, the animals, the humans, you know, drawing that connection and seeing how it's all interrelated. So, so what's next for you? What other projects are you working on along these lines? We have a few exciting projects. One is, uh, with the green acres foundation. And I'm particularly excited about this one because this is an integrated crop livestock system. And we are making an entire diet out of the produce that they get, that they make, uh, that they produce on their farm. So they, they use what's called lay rotation. So they grow probably 50 to 80 plants over the growing season and they grow it in, in a field and then the animals are on pasture. Um, but then next year they switch those fields. So then the yeah. animals would be grazing the, the where the crops were grown and then the, the crops will be grown on uh, where the animals were grazing. And what that does obviously is it much less need for synthetic fertilizer, much less need for, for pesticides. I don't think they use any. Um, and the animal is doing the work, right? They're fertilizing the, 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 the fields again. They're uh, having a beneficial effect on, on, on soil compaction and, and putting those plants down, right? The residue, because I don't know if you ever stepped on a, on a cornfield uh, after it's been harvested. Uh, there's still corn from next year if, because there's no trampling down, right? Uh, so it's like you want some decaying plant material uh, that goes back into the soil and then puts these nutrients yeah. back in. But animal impact can be very beneficial in that regard. So they do that. And so we're getting animal source foods from them, uh, eggs, uh, pork, beef. Uh, we also get, get milk um, and then all the plant foods. And so we call it like sort of a agroecological diet. Uh, regenerative diets, you could call it like that too, although in, in academia we typically use ag agroecology, uh, yeah. which is sort of the, the integration of, uh, of plants and, and animal uh, uh, livestock in, in a more sustainable way. Um, so nature-based solutions, agriculture. And so we make an entire diet out of that and then compare that to a conventional. So what if we just go into the grocery store and we buy the equivalent foods in the grocery okay. store, which are typically grown in, in these conventional monocultures, right? And the same with the animal source food. So we made an entire diet out of that. And we're doing a randomized controlled trial with that. We're actually starting uh, this month. So the study will take obviously take a while to complete, but the study is twofold. We A, will profile probably like a hundred foods or so, uh, conventional and uh, agroecologically grown to see those, those nutritional differences. We've been seeing those, especially in beef and in milk. Um, we're also doing plant foods now. And then we make an entire diet out of that four week diet. Uh, we look, we do again, do metabolomics profiling, which gives us a good indicator about oxidative stress of the people, uh, their mitochondrial health and other like, you know, my, uh, glucose metabolic health, acylcarnitine, right. which, which brings us those, those fats Very to cool. the mitochondria. So we, yeah. we're doing this deep metabolic profiling on both the foods and uh, the humans eating that to see if, okay, do these more regenerative diets that are presumably more nutrient dense, do they have an appreciable health effect on metabolism and health in, in the short term in this case? Yeah, that's great. I mean, I love just, just studying the different ways that food is grown and then trying to make that connection to human health is I, that's the key. So I'm so glad to hear you working on that. And I, I really look forward to that. We'll have to have you back on the show when those results come out and, and talk more about it. But 
Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you for all the work you're doing, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Brett. I really appreciate that.